And here we are. I'm live and waiting for people to join the podcast or Q&A session. You're here in Hangouts. And if you are viewing this on YouTube, just would like to point out that I'm pretty sure this is somewhere slightly different on your screen than it is on mine. Um, let me just start the screen share. And if we can ignore this sort of picture in picture moment here, here on the side, there is something called showcase and there's something called Q and A. This Q and A is where you can enter questions. So if you don't have time to have your question directly answered, if you put your question in that box, then everyone will, then I'll be able to get to your question before we finish. So of course, until I have people here asking me questions, I can go through the basics, but I'll wind up going through them a few times. Um, so again, you'll see um, a grid icon. If you haven't used this before, you'll see a grid icon close to the top, I think, of your screen. That grid will have both a yellow showcase button and a Q&A button. The yellow showcase button will have a list of links, most of which we'll be talking about at some point during this today. And the Q&A button is where you can enter your questions so we can make sure they get answered. I'd like to give just a couple of more minutes. And please, um, if you have any questions, please go to the Q&A section and enter your questions there. And I'd like to give just a few more minutes for people to join before I start to, before I turn on the screencasting and I will walk through the entire process from beginning to end. Um, this is scheduled for a whole hour and a half, and so I'm relatively certain I'll wind up going through some of the same things multiple times as some people come on and leave. Uh, the choice of this time of day was to try to get as many people as possible into the session. Thank you for joining me. Um, like I said, in a moment, I'm just waiting for a few more people to join. And I'm also going to see if I can point out where that, um, okay, so I'm starting to see questions come up. Very good. So at least at least one person has found, um, found the Q&A section. So we'll see if we have that coming in. And going to see if I can add And just two more minutes. I'd like to wait till 3.05. I'm seeing the numbers of people viewing heading up. And I will turn on my screen sharing now. And it'll be a little distracting for a second. Uh, I'm sharing the entire screen and we'll get a little sort of picture in picture effect. I apologize for that trippiness. And let's get out of here. Um, I'll explain this whole piece and let me get also the main site up. And I'll talk through the entire process, all of the little pieces, every component of it, how it works, how you can join us, um, how projects are built. And I'm coming back here, and I'm going to stop the, the screen share because, as you can see, <laughs> that little picture-in-picture -picture moment there can be a little bit intimidating. Great. So we're starting to get uh, some questions coming in. And I'm seeing 
again, our viewer numbers heading up. So I'd say right about now, I'm going to start going through things. Hello, my name is Stephen J. Cohen. Um, I run day-to-day -day operations at Listen to a Book. And Listen to a Book, here we are on the web at listen the number 2 abookcom Listen to a Book primarily focuses on publishing public domain audiobooks. It's what we've done uh, from the beginning. Uh, currently, we have about 1,400 titles published. Um, we've expanded beyond that, and we're working with people and doing other things beyond that. Uh, we're working with people in situations where they cannot work through ACX for one of a number of reasons. We're working with people who find doing the whole DIY ACX thing a little too intimidating, or people who feel they need a little bit more industry expertise in order to get a quality product at the end. Um, listen to a book. Uh, people, uh, okay, just looking at some of the questions. So the first thing, if you're a narrator, and you're looking to join us, you'd like to actually throw your hat into the ring and work with us on some projects. The place you want to come here on the Listen to a Book website is the link that's appropriately named Join Us. And the Join Us link uh, has a quick explanation and a wonderful video that our friend Sean Allen Pratt recorded um, explaining what it's like to really be an audiobook narrator and then this form immediately underneath just asks some general questions. Uh, you work your way through this form, just answer it as completely as possible. Remember to click the I'm not a robot button and send it. Um, I will review all of the things that come in. It may take me a while to actually get back to everyone. But this is the process where we start. You give me some basic information. We talk about some projects you'd like to do. We talk about um, what things you feel might help you grow as a narrator or an actor, what kinds of things you really feel that you'd excel in that you're not getting a chance to do, or if you have been doing a lot of work in a particular genre and you want to try to work on some of the classics, we can see if we can find some public domain works that kind of mirror some of the other work that you've been doing so we can deepen your resume that way. Um, and so that's the beginning of the process, is joining us. I'm going to flip back over to the other screen, and I apologize again for the picture and picture, picture and picture effect. And of course, I just showed that part with the screen off. Let me just pop back in, and we'll do that for a split second. I apologize. So over here, as I said, on the Listen to a Book website, there is a join us link. The join us link has the join us page. Here's that wonderful video by Sean Allen Pratt. And a very basic form that asks you some things about you, your place in the industry, um, what kind of work you've been doing, how you usually work on promoting your work, and some technical questions about your studio and how you tend to work on things? Do you send things out to, an, to another engineer? Do you do your own cover art? Do you work with an outside graphic artist when you do covers and things of that sort? And we pull that information together and that helps us start off the conversation. So assuming we've had this conversation and we're working on a project together, the next thing that would happen is you would get a login to our project tracker system. A project tracker system you is here. Uh, as you can see, I have this wonderfully creative generic narrator. And our generic narrator can propose a project, uh, update existing projects, look through previous projects he's worked upon, uh, and there's a helpful downloads link. Can also look back through his earnings. And earnings here, as you can see, are quarterly. Um, Audible pays out quarterly to small publishers. And that so that's a difference be, between working here and working through ACX. Um, you would wind up seeing your royalties quarterly. And so you can go through and see what they would be. Um, let's start off, just walk the entire project system through from one end to the other. OK, just one second before I do that, just seeing questions coming through. And 
stopping the screen share. I apologize. Okay. Great. All right. So people want me to start from the absolute beginning. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Going back into the project tracker for John. So John is a first time narrator. So the first time you log in, I advise people to go to the help section and you can see that here we have an overview of the basics, everything from before you begin to how to work on a project, all the way through to some frequently asked questions. Is there a template for opening and closing credits? And as you can see, when you click, it'll show you the answer to that particular question. Um, each of these are questions that we've gotten asked time and time again. And since the answers are very straightforward, it's easier to put that all here. And so, yeah, look through the overview of the basics before you begin. Um, if you've been using the system, you'll notice that whenever this has been changed, the last updated date gets changed. So you'll know that this information was current as of the 8th of December. Just going back to the dashboard. So the very first thing that you're asked to do is to go in and update your information. The reason why having this information correct is so important is if this information is incorrect, we can't pay you. Uh, we need correct information here for a few reasons. One is um, so that we can pay. And the other is uh, so we can contact you. And our third reason is when you do a book in the public domain, you own the you are the rights holder for that particular production we need the name in here that you would like represented so if we've created the account with a nickname and you need a different name to show up there for legal reasons then you want to make sure this is accurate not to how you're called but to how you'd like things to appear on official documents in addition to changing that basic piece of information you can also go in and update your password very basic and straightforward because the system will have assigned you one in the beginning. Once you've done all that, you can ignore this top section except when you feel you need to go back and look at the help. Um, so the very first thing you'd want to do is to propose a project. So in this particular case, we're going to have John Smith decide that he wants to narrate The Wizard of Oz. Might be good if I spelled it correctly. And he'll write in all the information. And he'll think about when he thinks he might be finished with it. Um, either he's got a lot of time right now and he's going to burn right through it, or maybe he's planning on working on this project in between other projects. And so he's pretty sure he's not going to finish this project until sometime relatively late in February. He doesn't have to know the exact date right now, but he's going to guess it's going to take him till about February 21st. Now, what would you put in this box? It's talking about notes, relevant links, documentation concerning copyright status. Um, for many of these books, you can find, if, if you're trying to prove that the book is actually in the public domain, especially if you're trying to prove the book is in the public domain in the United States, Whatever links you found online to support that are helpful. Uh, I will then do a little bit of extra research to confirm that you've actually found a work that's in the public domain. Um, a rule of thumb is everything before 1923 is in the public domain, but there are exceptions where certain things that are later than that um, have fallen out of copyright for one of a number of reasons. And if your work falls into that category, it's, it's much more important that you put information in here. Um, you know, if you found the book on Gutenberg or, or some other thing, and just give me the link to where you found the text and whatever information. You know, um, what I just, of course, I'm making something up. But that would be my proof that The Wizard of Oz is in the public domain, and he would hit Submit. Once he hits Submit, it just lets him know that it's been submitted and will contact you once it's been reviewed. Now, I'm going to give you a peek into the back end, and this will help you understand what actually happens. 
John doesn't know what's going on at this moment. He's made his proposal, but he can't really see behind the scenes to see what goes on. The next morning, I get an email. and My email says there's something for me to see in my project approval queue. I hit this. And here it is. The Wizard of Oz, L. Frank Baum. I see it. I check that the proof makes sense. Yes, this is in the public domain. I'm going to mark it active. When I hit this update button, an email will go out to John Smith, letting him know that it's all set to go. So I hit the update button. Now, we go back over here. And John has received an email explaining that, yes, his project is now active. So he comes here to update projects. And here it is, The Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. Now, once he opens his project for the first time, he has three things that he sees he can do. He can email the publisher, which would be me. Uh, this will open up. Uh, an email in your preferred email client, and it will already have some information in the subject line about the book, and it will come to the publisher. If you're working on a multiple narrator project, um, maybe something where you have a male and a female narrator, or maybe you're working on an audio drama and you have multiple people working on the project with you, you'd see other links here that would let you contact more than just the publisher. Obviously, the first thing we want to do is sign our contract because without our contract, we can't get paid. So first thing we do is we hit the contract button. And you'll see the details here of the contract, the full system. And you can read through the contract. And in this case, we're just going to have Mr. Smith sign here. And he's going to sign his contract. When he signs his contract, it then lets us know the contract has been saved and can be downloaded. When I go back into my project now, inside the Wizard of Oz, we're going to see that it now says print contract instead of sign contract. Just to show you what happens in case you haven't done this with our system before, printing the contract will generate a PDF of the contract. You can also go in and see old copies of other contracts that you need. So here's the PDF that you can use, which shows the contract and how this works. Um, now we have update project details. Here in Update Project Details, this is the piece that you'll be using most often. Right now, he's still in pre-production. He's probably reading the book. He may be marking up the book. And then eventually, he'll move into production and recording when he's working on his book. And eventually, he'll move into post-production when he's working on um, the editing and the mastering, whether he's doing this with external help or doing this himself. As he's working, maybe he decides his target date needs to slip a bit. Maybe he's not going to quite make the 21st. He's going to need to wait until the 25th. And he can keep other notes here. As you can see, it's set up in a way that you can just keep whatever information in this form that you would like about the project. So it, it lets you um, store links and images, all different kinds of things just anything that you need if you're working on the project. The other interesting thing is we have some people who are recording with a pseudonym. So if you're recording with a pseudonym, what you'll need to do is you will just type the pseudonym in here. Maybe our John Smith wants to be known as John Doe. and he'll update his current project. And just to sort of see that this is all updating.
just to see that this is all updating, you're seeing that the target dates are moving, the pseudonym is in, and now we're moving to our completed project. Sorry, things are a little slow. Let's try this again. And it would appear that the screen share stopped. I apologize. <laughs> the screen share was working and the screen share stopped. So here we back here we are again. Let's just move back to the dashboard. I will move quickly through these pieces. I apologize that the screen share stopped. It must be, um, I, I don't know what caused the problem, but let's go back in here. So let's go to the dashboard again, just because I'm not exactly sure which place it started and stopped on. Proposed projects, we have our project proposed. And then here we are, update projects, the Wizard of Oz. We now have print and we're coming here into details. So as you can see, all this is still editable. Here's post-production as I was talking about. Changing the dates. Receiving email alerts. Um, email alerts will let you know as you're getting closer to your targeted completion date. As you see, you can change this date at any time. So those alerts are simply a reminder that you are getting close to your target date for completion. Um, this is more important so I have an idea when completed projects will be coming to me as opposed to um, as opposed to things earlier in the system. I need to know whether I need to budget time to process 10 books in a day or two books in a day when they're when they're finished. So it's just more important to me if you're wondering where, what I honestly is most important, it's here, this target completion date. So as, your work goes on, that's what you'd be making sure, that's what you'd be checking on. So here is where our John Doe wants to now be known, sorry, our John Smith wants to be known as John Doe. Any other notes, the notes can be images, videos, links, any information you're storing about the project. And let's change this completion date again just to show you what I mean. So when I hit this and I'm updating the completion, what you'll wind up with is it'll all work. And here we get to the end. And now he's done all of his work. He has all of his information and he's ready to upload. This is a piece that some people miss. Um, essentially, there is another form that's hidden. And the instructions here at the top of this actually walk you through all that information. Um, so until you mark it as ready to upload, you can't see the upload completed project form. The upload completed project form is the, it does a few things. It lets me know that the work is ready to go, but it also uh, has some details that I need in order to be able to send the information to Audible. When we up, upset this and we come back into the project one last time, you'll see that now below this form, post-production, sorry, ready to upload, update current project, back into the project. One second. Here we are, I apologize for that. Upload completed projects, this other form shows up. Upload completed projects is looking for certain information. It's looking for the total duration in minutes reported by second opinion. We'll go over what second opinion is for, in a moment. It's looking for the description of, of your audiobook, your sales copy, the information that will be along with your book to sell it, categories, 
Uh, if you look through Audible, you'll see that books are listed in categories. And the location, the URL for your completed project, your pro um, you'll have your audio uploaded to something like Google Drive, OneDrive, Dropbox, Box, one of those services. I need the URL that you're sharing from here. So if we do this form from top to bottom, the first thing this is talking about is a program called Second Opinion. And so we're going to show you right now Second Opinion. And we're going to do that by minimizing everything and going out to my desktop. Second Opinion runs on both Windows and Mac. It's a small program that I wrote, and it is built in such a way that really what it's doing is it is checking the audio against against the um, here. If I just pop this up, it'll just run through what I'm talking about. It'll it, it checks the audio against a whole bunch of specs. Um, is there enough silence at the head and the tail of the file? Is the average RMS of the file within the specified range? Are the peaks of the audio too high? All the information about what these specs are can be found at that help link inside the project tracker. Um, and this is just some other pieces about what it talks about. An alert is something that it's found an issue and it's going to try to fix it itself. An error is something that's going to take a trained human ear, whether that's you or another engineer in order to handle. Um, also, there are ways to name your file, which are described inside the system that um, you need to follow the file naming conventions for it to understand what your files are. Um, this works by choosing a directory, not the audio files themselves. And so in this case, I'm trying to think, remember if there's actual audio that's still inside that folder. Just double check. Uh, this is stuff I was working on earlier today. No, that one's done. So if that one's done, I can take it to, oh, I know which one I can take it to. I can take it to this one. All right. So. Instead of having it actually do repairs, I'm just going to start it for a moment and show you how this works. Um, there's a few different settings. We can tell it to check only, in which case it won't modify any of the audio. Check and fix, it will actually try to do repairs. There are two ways to handle audio that are above negative three decibels. One is for it to use a limiter. The other is for it to normalize. I won't go into the details of what that means right now. Uh, usually, it'll default to limit. In most cases, limiting the audio above negative three is a better choice. Um, mono check enabled or disabled. Essentially, most audiobooks we deliver will be recorded in mono. If you're sending stereo files of a single voice, you're wasting bandwidth and wasting your time. Um, so this will take files it finds in stereo and mix them down to mono. Now, if you were doing an audio drama, you would definitely want to leave that um, check. You would want to leave this disabled because I'm assuming that with an audio drama, you will have a sound stage where you're having people talk to each other. Um, and you may have somebody sort of focused to the left or right. And the mono check will flatten that out and bring everybody into the middle. Also, it takes WAV, FLAC, or AIF files as input. I usually ask people to send FLAC files for one reason. FLAC files are smaller. All three of these file types are lossless files. Um, none of them cause any sort of an issue. Uh, the, the audio inside these files will all be equal, but FLAC will be the smallest of the three. When you click Analyze, it'll start working, and it'll report out here to the screen what it's doing. If there are any alerts, it'll or errors, it will update this, and it says it's running through 32 files. And as you can see, it's looking at the file peaks, the average RMS, and it's doing some math and it's counting. There's no reason for me to let this go through the entire thing. Um, essentially, when you get to the end of this, though, there is a number, and that number is what's important for you. Um, essentially, let's just move into one where I can look at a finished report. 
So what you're seeing here is that there was no errors. The audio passed inspection. And it says that the total duration was this number of seconds or this number of minutes, 182 minutes. If I come back to the existing projects, this wants 182 minutes. So the total length is what was reported, 182 minutes. And this is where my sales copy for The Wizard of Oz would go. Um, you know, so whatever information Whatever I think is going to help sell it, this is where that sales copy lives. Um, classics, American literature, children. And whatever else I think as I'm looking through And then the URL. And it would probably look something like this. And so here we have the, the last piece of information. When this information is submitted, and obviously you'd want a better sales copy than what I'm using here in my example. I then get another email. This lets you know the form was submitted, the project status is set to review, and it's been queued up for a QC review, quality control review by me, and then it will be packaged for sale. And I'm going to go in, and we will see that here under project review, Here's the information for what it is we're doing. And this is where I then get the information that I then have to send on to Audible. So The Wizard of Oz, L. Frank Baum, John Smith is our narrator. He'd like to be called John Doe. There's his email address if I have any problems with, with my work on it. He's the rights holder. Um, what you're seeing here, this this calculation is something that came from Audible. Um, essentially, I will put the retail price, the suggested price, as 1631, and it's likely, although not guaranteed, to sell on Audible for 7.99 if I do that. So this 182-minute piece will be done that way. This 61-minute piece will go in as 12.12. Sorry, yes, which will come out as 5.99, and then I use this information. Here, if I mark it as complete, because I've then downloaded it, done all the work on my end, prepared it, sent it off to Audible, done all the other forms they ask me to do, once Audible tells me everything is okay, I come back here and I hit the complete button. When I do, our narrator gets uh, notified that it is then left listened to a book and has gone on to Audible. And since Unlike ACX, the QC is done mostly on our end. Um, that that um, does uh, it. Usually, it, it's simply a, a, a matter of um, a week or two, depending upon how backed up things are for them before it goes live. But essentially, once it passes our QC, um, there isn't really a step at Audible where they will turn it around. They may have some questions if some things don't add up but usually they're things that I can fix. So minimizing these, going back to your screen, finding you, and I will turn off the screen share. So I apologize to people who were only seeing the picture at first. Um, so now I'm going to run through some of these questions that are here. And, and if there's anything that people need me to redo, I have no problem redoing it. And I apologize for the glitch that caused that. So the first question I have here is, I understand that listen to a book has distribution that goes beyond 
Audible, iTunes, and Amazon. Can you tell us more about that? Well, thank you. Thank you for that one. Let me bring up the information so I have it here in front of us before I can show it to you and talk about that. Um, yeah, I was spending my time, obviously, talking about process and listen to a book. Share. Great. Here we are. So I'm going to just change where we are. This was about distribution. Um, listen to a book is two different distribution agreements. The basic distribution, which is purely digital distribution, uh, goes through the three most common, most popular marketplaces for audiobooks worldwide, Audible, iTunes, and Amazon. Um, you receive an eight, you receive 80% of the total royalty paid quarterly. If you have your content only in ebook format via Amazon, or you tend to partner with Amazon on product placement for your web presence, this is really the method for you. Um, the thing to remember is that the bulk of audiobooks today are distributed digitally. Fewer people are actually buying CDs. Um, you need to really be in a different, uh, going at things slightly differently in order for the, the CD distribution to be for you. But here's what that digital plus physical distribution gets you. Beyond those three marketplaces, also being in places like Downpour, Nook, so that way you're not only on all of those um, Kindle devices, but you're also on all the Nook devices in their built-in store actual physical copies in places like Barnes and Noble and Costco's and Hastings and Books a Million, um, and also potentially uh, uh, getting your work via OverDrive and, uh, and Hoopla and apps like that into the library system. Um, the people who these physical books are really, um, really aimed at uh, if your person tends to sell copies of your book uh, at conferences or lectures um, or anything of that, conventions, uh, then getting the CDs and having them in hand so that way if somebody comes up to you and sees the physical book and says, I need a CD of that, I, need, I, I, I want the audio book, you can actually go and do that right there in the moment. Um, also, the other thing, of course, is getting yourself into libraries. Um, the CDs are on, you can get the CDs for 50% off and net 30 day terms, and you can order as few or as many of them as you need. So if you need 50 of them or 500 of them or a thousand of them, it doesn't really matter. The size of the order is, is open. Um, you receive 75% of the total royalty paid quarterly. Now, uh, so then you're receiving less, but you're receiving less royalty on a much wider level of distribution. The primary difference between doing this and going through ACX, where you choose a non-exclusive agreement, is in ACX, you wind up actually with a lower royalty payout, and they don't help you get into these other marketplaces. All they will do is get you into those three and then say, yes, you are legally now allowed to do all the work yourself to get into these other marketplaces. So if you're working with an author who would like to do a non-exclusive distribution and have their work available more widely, you can do better than working through ACX because there is no assistance from their end on getting your book into any of these market marketplaces. We can also um, talk about other special needs. If you're someone who wants your work distributed with no DRM, no digital rights management or any other thing. We can talk about that and work on a custom distribution agreement. So to go back here, I will stop the screen share. And what goes into what goes into selecting a title that will okay, we're moving back and forth. <laughs> All right, I've selected a question. Uh, 
what considerations go into selecting a title that will generate sales and royalties, of course. In other words, how do we determine what might sell and make money for a narrator? Now, generically, thinking about books that sell uh, is, is a great place to start. And things that you can look at are, you can look at what books are required reading. Required reading in schools is a great way, especially when you're looking through the classics, to, to have a basis of what, you know, a basic place. But that doesn't really necessarily pick the best book for you. The best book for you is going to go back to what I was talking about originally. Um, as an actor, and most of you are actors, there are, there are acting challenges. And there are people who, when you hear them, you go, oh, my God, I, I would love to hear him play Hamlet. Well, when I hear somebody and I talk to them, I think, wow, I'd love to hear their Huck Finn. Or I would love to hear this person do Lovecraft. You know, they have that voice and they can get that eerie feeling there. You know, or wanting to, you know, I can run through a million authors because now I'm hearing narrators' voices. So occasionally what I'll do is I'll get on and start talking to someone. Um, the other the other kinds of things, the best fit for you is going to get the best narration. But the question really wasn't about the best fit for you, it was about generating sales. So in addition to looking for books, uh, you can actually look through Project Gutenberg in a way where you can find the top downloads at Project Gutenberg. And Project Gutenberg has e-texts of um, public domain classics. So you can actually see what's being downloaded. You can do the same thing in Audible. You can go to their eBooks into the free public domain section and see what things are the most, uh, most interesting to download, things that are having, having the highest levels of downloads. Those are a couple of ways for you to go about it. Um, other things for you to do are to go, believe it or not, over to the IMDB. If you look in the IMDB for the next year for projects that aren't published yet and see what is coming out soon that has a public domain tie-in, then releasing your audiobook just as a movie is hitting is a great way to actually plug into a publicity campaign that's already being done. You then watch that publicity start to work, and you do publicity that pulls people towards your audiobook. So using two examples of things that are coming up, a few years back, there was an Alice in Wonderland, and next year there's going to be a Through the Looking Glass with Johnny Depp from the same people. So recording Through the Looking Glass and Alice in Wonderland right now, and then watch that to start and trying to plug into that piece of public media is a great way to bring people to your production. Another example of a book that's coming up is The Jungle Book is about to be done as a live action, full length feature. So if Rudyard Kipling really works for you, it's a great way for you to actually um, do that, for you to plug back into promotion that's already going on so that you can work through things and, um, and, and ride that larger media train. Another thing is um, this coming year is the 100th anniversary of the passing of Jack London. So you're actually, you're looking at a slightly smaller group, but you're looking at a dedicated group because believe me, there will be teachers who, because it's 100 years since he died, who will be moving Jack London into their curriculum. So you're actually marketing at a, at, not at a movie level group, but at a slightly lower group. And if you, as an audiobook narrator, having narrated the book, if you feel you have something that you can add, then put together even a vague lesson plan about the book that you've done. Put it up on the web and say, this lesson plan is free for you to use. And by the way, here's a link to my audiobook. This is a good way for you to leverage, again, things in media, things that are happening, and bring that back to you as a sale. I, I hope, Bill, I hope that was a, a good answer to your question. Now let's choose another one here. And I want to thank everybody for pointing out that they were only seeing my picture. And all right, so... Oh, here comes a good one. 
Karen. So, uh, listen to a book only deals with public domain books. Is that correct? Would an author of today do well via listen to a book? It's a good question, Karen. And here's what's going on. So, listen to a book started off doing these pieces in the public domain. Uh, currently, we have about 1,300 titles there, but we're looking to expand. And part of why we're looking to expand is I see a very large chasm. There's the traditional way that books are getting done. Uh, you know, the traditional publication route where somebody offers you an advance and then they take all the risk and then you don't see a penny until they've at least made that amount where that advance is. And then you're getting a small royalty. And I know that I'm not mostly talking to authors who are in that boat. Most authors who I'd be talking to are indie authors. And there's so much that you all had to deal with when you were trying to publish your physical book and get physical copies and ebook copies. And there are all these things you had to learn that maybe you did or didn't know. You know, there's a lot of intricacies to the publishing industry on its own. And I know I've spoken to a lot of people who've talked about how much of an education that was working through that. Well, unfortunately, when you start to do an audiobook, you've got all those same things all over again. You've got a whole other industry with a whole other set of standards. And your options are to either do a sort of DIY, do it yourself thing through the ACX platform, or what? I mean, you know, if you're not published with a large publisher, you don't have somebody who's going to take that risk for you and help you. What we're trying to do is we're trying to actually find a middle road. Um, we can work with you, talk with you, and try to match you up with narrators who seem to be a good fit for your book, match you up with editors who understand your material. And realize when I'm talking about editors, I'm not talking about text. I'm talking about people who are used to editing audio. So if we can match you with a good team, then instead of the sort of DIY thing where you then have to learn a whole new set of skills yet again, like you needed to learn when you were publishing your own book, we can connect you with other people so that there's a more cooperative method as opposed to the, the do-it-yourself method that's out there or the traditional method, which is not accessible to everyone. Um, I can also work with authors and narrators who can't use Audible's platform, who are based in countries where they don't have access to doing that. Um, so uh, Audible is working on expanding that. I, as an example, I know Canadian-based narrators and I think Canadian-based authors actually have to jump through quite a number of hoops in order to get an, uh, an audiobook done through through Audible, uh, we can actually work around that and deal with a lot of those issues for people in that situation. Um, and like I said, if you are a, an independent author and you're going around to places like conventions or conferences, you know, you are the person who would actually do well to have CDs next to the physical copies of your book on that table or for sale after that talk. So you are who we're talking to and you are the direction that we're, we're working to grow the business. So if you head over to the listen to a book page and click on contact, I'd be happy to talk to you or anyone else about what it is that we're working on today. Next question. Nate, I'm going to need to ask you something in a minute. Okay, so this is more. All right, so. Do you have some success stories you can share with us, sales and royalty share money figures? Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, okay, so what I can tell you is that over the past year, uh, Listen to a Book has paid out about $50,000 in royalties. Um, I can't really give you other people's, um, what individuals are earning. And I feel like if I went into an individual book's earnings, I would be violating, with without the permission of the narrator, uh, I would be violating a trust there. So I can't go into individuals, but I can show you one second. Let me 
pop back over. We're going to share that page again. And just pointing out what's going on here. So our list of narrators is growing. Uh, some of these people are very well established. Peter Burkert among them, Don Harvey. Um, so these are people who are working. Paul Woodson's done some incredible work recently, not only for us, but for quite a few people. You know, this and I love Al Kessel's narration. And if you've ever thought of listening of, of the Book of Tea, Ken, no relation, Ken Cohen, absolutely wonderful work. So I'm seeing some wonderful work from the, these people. Um, and it's, it's growing day in, day out. Um, but our most recent large production was with Johnny Heller. Um, Johnny narrated... Huckleberry Finn. Um, and uh, this was a joy to work on, a joy to publish, a joy to publish. And um, we're we're going to we're going to push this and, and see where this is going. An, an interesting thing, of course, that happened was the recent news. Um, a school in Philadelphia um, removed Huckleberry Finn from the curriculum. And because they removed Huckleberry Finn from the curriculum, uh, we chose to set it up so that we would give away copies of the book to any classroom teacher who asked. And then taking some of my own advice, um, I'll see if I can make this come up on the screen for you. I think you're seeing this. Audiobooks in the Classroom, a field guide. This is a, a lesson plan that I put together on how to use audiobooks in the classroom, which is coming back to here. Here's our audiobooks in the classroom, a field guide. So these things are doing well. Um, how well? The thing to remember about public domain audiobooks is that they're not new. So you don't get the burst that you get. Uh, when something is brand new. Typically, when a new title comes out, there's some buzz around it, then it fades away. In the case of, of public domain classics, these books have a very long sales curve. These books are listened to time and again, over and over, by new people every year. So it really is about making the money over time here. These books are much more likely to sell quarter after quarter than a new book that doesn't become a hit. If I'm hoping that at least talks to some of the points you wanted. I, I, and I'm sorry that I just don't feel comfortable sharing somebody's sales figures um, with you because I would need to talk to the narrators themselves about that. Okay. Um, yep. The, points on the screen share, just seeing my mugshot. Thank you very much. Um, and yes, thank you everyone for pointing out the need for the screen. And here we have, here's, um, oh, we already did this. Top section. I'm, I may need to ask you, Nate, exactly what you mean by top section would love to see a visual. Um, so I'm guessing that what you're talking about is back here. So let me uh, stop the screen share for a second. And I will come back into, yeah, let's go back. All right, share, and then update project. back to the dashboard. So I apologize for the technical problems up front. The top section, I'm hoping this is what you were talking about. Um, so aside, log in, help, update user information, propose projects, update projects, previous projects, and helpful downloads. What we're seeing here is
what we're seeing and I although I won't click on this one I'll click I'll click through on mine to show you what mine are you can also go through and see the quarterly earnings that you have made uh, the difference between this screen and my screen quite quite honestly are I have all these management controls that are below this so again come here to propose a new project when you have a project here to work on a project here to review projects you've done previously And here for a list of helpful downloads, whether they are tax forms, um, second opinion, a sample project. So that way you can actually download a project to see exactly how we'd like it formatted. The audio converters that people tend to use, some simple editors and some simple plugins. So hopefully that was the answer to that other question. And what did I mean? Oh, let's click here, Mr. Alda. What did I mean by sales copy? Well, let's pop back out to the screen and I'll show you exactly what I mean. So if you go over into Audible, and actually let me, let me just do it this way. If we go back into Audible, one second. We'll just let it go over into Audible. Here's our Huckleberry Finn, narrated by Johnny Heller. And where is, oh, I'm sorry, it should have done it in Audible because for whatever reason, they're not showing it here. Audible. <laughs> And apologize for the slowness. Huckleberry Finn. Johnny Heller. And here we go. So in this case, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about sales copy is this. Uh, the publisher's summary, the information. So... Audio award-winning narrator Johnny Heller is Huckleberry Finn in this brand new edition of the classic American story. Huck's understanding of the world around him evolves as he and Jim, a runaway slave, travel the Mississippi River, a coming-of-age journey for both Huck and listeners alike for over 100 years and counting. And so this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the, um, the, the, the sales copy. The same sort of thing as when you're selling your, your book, the blurb that you're using promotionally. And we already did bills. And, yep, and I got that everybody couldn't see, so could it, ah, here we are. Hello, Lori. So as a narrator, could we recruit authors to have their audiobooks distributed through Listen to a Book, or is this only public domain books? We can do work with, uh, work with authors and living, you know, living authors and narrators. Well, always living narrators, but we can work with, with contemporary authors. It, we can offer you a flexibility that you can't get through ACX. Through ACX, you are really limited by their system to either do a 50-50 royalty share or for them to pay you per finished hour. Yes, some people sort of work out side deals to do things, but you can't formalize those side deals through a system. Or you can't talk to an author and, and instead of doing a 50-50 split, you know, maybe they understand that you're doing a lot of the work and you'd like to do a 60-40 split or something else. However things are being arranged, we can actually work in ways that ACX can't because we can work with you with our system to include multiple narrators, change those percentages, 
work on different pieces um, in, in different ways. So this is not limited only to public domain books. Uh, the core of the business has been public domain books. And we're looking to work with you and provide solutions where there aren't where there aren't solutions already in place. So I, I hope that answers that question. Looking through the list. Uh, here we go. Thank you, Karen. Is listen to a book a big proponent of punch and roll on particular DAW pro programs for that matter, or particular DAWs for, for that matter? Um, here's what I care about. I care about the final audio that is being submitted to me uh, needs to be ready to go. Um, and if you do a straight record or if you do punch and roll, in either case, I'm not receiving it at that point. I will help you as a narrator connect with an engineer. Now, you may talk to an engineer who says, I only work with punch and roll, um, in which case, you know, you might need another engineer if you really want to do a straight record. Uh, some engineers may have some engineers may have uh, a different rate for working on a straight record versus a punch, work, working on punch and roll. And as far as being a big pro uh, proponent of particular DAWs, um, if you're asking me for assistance, I'm, I'm more helpful in things that I'm familiar with. But um, a FLAC file is a FLAC file is a FLAC file. Uh, it doesn't matter what the project files are by the time I get them, I'm not receiving those. I'm receiving a FLAC, a wave, or an MP3. Not usually an MP3, except if somebody's just sending me a sample. So what I'm looking at there is um, I'm looking at the final output. And that should be the same whether you're using Pro Tools or Twisted Wave or Reaper or any other program. Um, so I, I hope that answered your question. Okay, ACX, David, this is another great question. And people are, are, are liking your question, so it's, it's good for me to know uh, that we're answering things that people care about. ACX only offers a narrator royalties for seven years. Would an audiobook published through you offer royalties indefinitely? Well, just to clarify, ACX offers a seven-year contract that if neither you nor the author backs out of after seven years, will continue indefinitely. What it's offering you is once every seven years, the ability for you or the author to back out of a contract. Um, so it's not that it only offers you that seven years. And ACX hasn't been around for seven years. So we're not really sure what's going to happen when that first seven years hits. Um, we do occasionally get contacted by Audible directly asking about whether or not they can buy out a book. Um, and buying out a book, it would then be us getting them in touch with you, the rights holder, to then see whether or not they could buy out the book from you for a fixed rate. And what they tend to do is they tend to project out a number of years based upon what your book has done in previous years and offer you a buyout based on that. Uh, this is a lot more rare with a public domain property than it is with something that they might want to re-record and feel like they need, well, you, you get my basics, the, the basic thing here. Um, our publishing agreement doesn't have that seven-year clause, but if there is a situation where they want to talk to you about buying out those rights, uh, that they can come to us and we will then come to you at that point. Uh, if you're working with, with a, a current author on a project, then you and that author would not be limited to the seven years, and the two of you could come together to try to amend that, um, that agreement at any point in the process. Um, the agreement that we're working with um, basically means that the two of you would need to agree in order to pull a book in, as opposed to the ACX situation, which is one or the other of you could pull the book on your own after seven years. I hope that clarifies both the ACX and 
and what makes us different. And I'm skipping the I'm only seeing your picture ones, and I apologize for that again. Oh, Richard, this is a good one. If we produce a book through Listen to a Book, do you have exclusive digital distribution rights, or can we still sell beyond whatever channels you are distributing to? So the page that I brought up before, and I can go back there, explains our two digital distribution pieces. Our traditional digital distribution is equivalent to what you get through ACX. It's an exclusive distribution agreement. Our other, our, what we have listed as digital and physical, is a non-exclusive agreement and can be modified to fit whatever you need. What we're actually offering in that case is we're offering the ability to get you into a number of other markets without you having to lift a finger. Um, if you want other particular rights beyond that, then it would be us sitting down with you and then setting up that custom contract to allow that to happen. So as an example, you know, if you choose the non-exclusive distribution and get the lower payout, which is still higher than the ACX payout, um, what we wind up with is you will wind up in Barnes and Noble, you'll wind up in the Nook store, you'll wind up in Downpour and all, in all these other places. Uh, but we need to know what it is that you're trying to work on so that way we can actually have the contract drawn up properly so that we know what we are limited to from your perspective. And it's not about limiting you, it's about limiting what we do so we're not stepping on your toes if you're planning on doing something else. So I, I hope that actually answers that question. Uh, it's not a... It's not a one-size-fits-all situation when you're talking about our non-exclusive agreement. Uh, you talk to us, we sit down, and we, we will go back and forth with you with a contract and work out which venues you're trying to do. If really all you want us to do beyond the big three is get it into libraries and you want to be able to handle the rest, we, we just need to know that up front. All right. Um, all right. So <laughs> I apologize to all of you who were talking about only seeing my picture. Uh, I'm looking to see. I'm going to select and list these as done so that way I can see the other real questions as they go by. Here we go. Here's a real one. Is there a book you can show us that is on a, on the expanded plan where the book is in the Nook, is in Nook, etc.? Um, so that is that that is part of a new agreement with us. So the primary agreement, what we were talking about before, uh, is our, our publishing agreement direct with Audible. The expanded plan actually just happened. It's brand new. And so it's become something that I'm talking with people about. Um, it's through Blackstone Audio. And because we represent such a large number of books, they were willing to work with us. And that's why our numbers are actually a bit better than what you would get from doing the non-exclusive through ACX. Um, right now, we have a couple of projects in the pipeline uh, heading out that way, but nothing that's actually gone live that way yet. Um, I can I can I can work with you and get you in touch with people and show you examples of what's going on there um, <clears throat> on an individual basis. But if, like I said, at the point at this point, it was just it was just announced for us uh, about a month or so ago, and um, and we're still working to get books through that pipeline. And I'm clearing out these that I wasn't seeing that I wish I had seen a little sooner so I didn't need to go back through. And Karen. Okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm, this is probably also referring to the fact that my screen was off. I apologize. All right. And it looks like I may have answered all the questions that are here.
And yes, Ken, it was, and I got it taken care of. So um, just to run back through for the people who are here at the end, I'll run quickly through this now that the screen share appears to be working. Um, that's me. Let's do this from the other end. Project Tracker. So here we have Mr. John Smith, who's one of our narrators. He has signed in. He's gone through the help section, and the help section has all different sorts of information, specifications on what cover art has to be like, audio production specifications, walks you through the basics of how to work on a project. Um, about royalties, what to do when you're ready to publish and upload, how to name your files. All of this is here under the help section. John has also gone through and updated his user information, which is important if he wants to get paid. It's also important if he wants to make sure his name is listed properly. He's also updated his password. So John would like to record. Well, let's, we're going to choose a book that's not in the public domain just because it's not a book any of us are ever going to get to record except if we've got to do it for the Library of Congress. Um, Catcher in the Rye, of course, is a famous book that we're not allowed to do. Like I said, except if you're recording for the Library of Congress. I think I may have misspelled Salinger. Um, so, and again, you can either power through a book, you know, if you've got time and you're working on that project straight through, that's fantastic. Or how a lot of people work with cat T C H might be nice if I spelled that correctly. Um, and then why I think it's in the public domain or maybe who knows, believe it or not. The family agreed that I can record this. I can send you the contract via email. Yippee. Yes, I would love for this to be real. So John Smith actually got in touch with, 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 this, with, with the Salinger estate, convinced them that he was the guy to do this as an audio book. And yippee, he's going to do it. He submits this. And he's back at the dashboard, just running through what the project looks like. Now, the next morning, later that day, I then get a notice. I click on project approval. Here it is. I read through this. I email back and forth with John Smith. I find out that, holy smoke, I can't believe it. He got permission to do this book. This is amazing. This is a coup. I click active. Once I do this, when John clicks update projects, he sees Catcher in the Rye. Very quickly, he wants to get this all done and out of the way. He wants to sign his contract. And John Smith, and he signs his contract. When he goes back into the project itself, You can see that now it's print contract. And just to show you what that looks like, if you didn't see it before, because I was not successfully sharing my screen, he can get a PDF of the contract at any time. And he can update the project details. Right now, he's in pre-production, which usually means he's reading the book and doing his research. He's putting notes in here about Holden. Other things could be links to different places. He's just using this to keep keep control of things. 
And yes, if he wanted to use a pseudonym, this is where he put it in. But who in their right mind would want to use a pseudonym if they got to do this? Email alerts. It'll tell you it's one month until your project is due. It is two weeks until your project is due. If you find those annoying or don't need them, you can just turn them off. But all they are is a, a reminder, and they're based upon the date that you set here. So if suddenly it's not going to be February 24th, it's going to be March 10th, that's up to you. You totally do that. Change these things the way you need to have them changed. This is the part that's important to me. It lets me know how far along you are in the project. We're up to post-production now. And the project has been updated. And now he's gone through his project. He's all ready. He's, he, he, let's say he's worked on this himself, which means he's, he's mastered the audio. He's put it through second opinion to confirm that it's all right. He's assembled the folder the way it asks for in the help section. So he's all ready. Clicks ready to upload. Sorry. Here we are. <clears throat> I apologize for the glitch on my end. Upload completed project appears after project details. Same thing as before, after running second opinion, you can put in the number it would be. And yes, if you select it and just type the number, it'll select that so you don't need to scroll down. Then here is where you would put that sales blurb. You know, all that sales copy, the stuff that's going to help you sell it. Might help if I could spell catcher. You know. So whatever the sales copy is, again, just for our demonstration purposes, it's not as important. Classics, American literature. Not children's lit and fantasy, though. You know, uh, you might look up. would work through and choose whatever you felt was appropriate. Um, I use yours as a guideline. Uh, if I see other categories that something fits in when I'm when I'm doing my submission, Audible changes them from time to time. Um, then I, I make sure that it's there as well. Again, let's just use my fake Dropbox link uh, and then submitting this project. Once the project is submitted, on my end, here it is, Catcher in the Rye, with all the information. I'm then going to use this information to fill out everything I need to fill out for Audible. If there was a problem and I needed to contact him, I could click here, and that would open up an email. And once it's complete, I mark complete, and he'll get an email explaining what went on. <clears throat> OK, so I've got a few more questions. I'm going to select this one. Stephen, I'm wondering about that link to your previous work as an engineer or editor. Having produced a number of books for ACX, I've worn all the hats, including engineer and editors. No, that's not an issue. Um, I would say about 40% of the people who record for us do their own engineering and editing. Um, it's actually been interesting because some uh, it's become almost a peer group where people are sharing some of the techniques they've developed. 
I'm, I'm, I'm actually seeing some people become better editors and engineers of their own books. Um, I've also seen that when somebody sort of goes down the rabbit hole where they maybe they've over overworked something and they're not quite sure how to fix it. You know, there was a weird noise they didn't realize until they were proofing and now they don't want to need to record a few chapters um, that people who have spent some time as their own engineer um, can better explain to another engineer when they have a problem. So I, I do occasionally get a question from somebody saying, hey, I just can't get this one to work right, can you recommend somebody? And what I'll do is I will give you a list of two or three other engineers who can help you out, who you can hire on an individual basis. Essentially, the second opinion program was really written for people like you. Uh, you've developed your habits and you've worked as an engineer. You've engineered your own stuff. And yes, engineering your own things is really kind of different from engineering for a lot of different people because you know your own issues which can be different from other people's issues. But what you'll find is when you're done, if you use the second opinion program, it's really just getting exactly that, a second opinion of your own work. And all of the specs that the second opinion program checks are actually also valid for ACX. There's a couple of things that are a little bit different about the length of the head and tail of the file, but the numbers that second opinion asks for are within the range that are acceptable on ACX. I think in certain circumstances, ACX will accept a shorter um, head and tail of a file than, um, than we can accept on our end. And as weird as that sounds, I know that in both cases, the audio is going to Audible. Audible has a slightly different requirement for people sending them stuff as a publisher than they do for the things that come in through ACX. So it's not a problem for you to be your own engineer. Um, the requirement for people to run this stuff through second opinion and to include the file that second opinion has when, you know, second opinion generates a text file about your audio. Um, that file will point out if there is a problem in chapter six that it can't fix on its own. Like I said before, it will fix minor issues, but there are certain things that, as you know, that will take a human ear in order to repair. Um, so you'll be able to use second opinion not only for this, but you can just go over to the site right now. Um, there is, in, in addition to this QA section, there is a showcase section. The showcase section has a series of links, including a direct link on where you can download second opinion, even if you aren't working with us. Uh, it's just up there for people to use because it, it just seemed like a useful tool to share with the community in general. So I hope that answered that question. Cover art, is that something we provide and we pay for or is there something else in place? So just like, um, let me click on that for Karen. So just like you were talking about being your own engineer, um, if you think about when you work on ACX, the author is providing the cover art um, and you're providing the engineering. You know, the author is providing the cover art and the sales copy and that end of it. That's what they bring to the table in addition to the book. And you're providing the editing and engineering of the audio. In the case of, let's say, you doing a royalty share with Louisa May Alcott, let's say you've always wanted to record Little Women, you know, and you, you, just, you just want to be able to read Joe Marsh and just make that real. Well, we can do that. You can do that. But there isn't an author. Louisa May isn't, not only is she not going to show up for her share of the royalties, and that's why you get 40% instead of 20, but she's also not there to provide cover art or a sales copy. Um, so just like I can connect you with a bunch of engineers, there's a growing list of people who have done book covers for us recently, or just other artists who I know who I've asked about, would you be interested in doing book covers? And I've been able to provide people with a list of three to five, depending upon the kind of book, uh, of people for them to contact. Also, of course, there are people using different sites where, where the kind of sites where you might go to generate, uh, have a competition for logos, you can also use for book covers. I tend to stay away from things like Fiverr, but there are sites where you can uh, do some crowdsource work at a, at a much better rate where you're actually getting some interesting things. Um, so 
yeah, I can connect you with people. And so really that's what's making this different. It's that you're an independent contractor as an audiobook narrator, and I'm connecting you with an independent contractor who may be a graphic artist, or I might be connecting you with an independent contractor who's, uh, who's an engineer. And you're doing those pieces of work, and what I'm providing for you is, A, I'm making the connections, B, I'm providing the software that simplifies the, the system, and C, I'm negotiating with Blackstone, with Audible, in order to get your things into the market. Uh, I'm also doing research when, when people bring up a book that we don't know if it's in the public domain. Um, in the United States, that is not necessarily incredibly clear. And so we've done some research and found some things. We've started some conversations with the families of some people because um, some books are and some books aren't in the public domain. And so I'm serving, I'm doing that work as well. So those are the components that I'm doing and how I'm connecting people with, with that. And so hopefully, hopefully that value comes through and you, can, and, and, uh, and you see that as something that works for, for you. And I hope I answered that question well. Lori, here we go. So if an author has a contract with Amazon that gives Amazon exclusive publishing rights, okay, I think I see where you're going. And I think that is create space publishing. They would not hold the audio rights, correct? It would still be owned by Amazon and therefore not eligible for this. You know, this is very interesting. And the only way to know for certain, Lori, is to either read the create space listing you know, to go and actually read the contract from CreateSpace or to call CreateSpace directly. And I think you're right that CreateSpace is owned by Amazon. Here is my understanding. And so please, this is, this is my understanding. Essentially, when you finish your work in CreateSpace, they make it so that you can then claim that book via ACX. It's not until you've claimed that book via ACX that there is anything connecting that book to ACX as an audiobook. So I would need to look through that particular Create Space contract in order to confirm this for you. But the way they have it set up, that publishing your ebook does not necessarily create an ACX project automatically and, and, and make that happen. My understanding is that the narrator, the not narrator, the author still owns all other media rights beyond print, that the digital rights they are talking about from CreateSpace are print rights. And I would be more than happy to look over a specific contract and just clarify that, or even facilitate a conversation with the people at Amazon and CreateSpace in order to clarify that point for you. But again, my understanding is that since CreateSpace essentially creates an ebook, and it doesn't automatically trigger the ACX process, that the Create Space contract is only talking about digital print, not digital audiobook or digital podcasting or if you were or your movie rights or anything of that sort. So yes, it should be eligible for this, and I would be more than willing to help do the footwork to, to confirm whether or not it is. And Karen. Oh, this is a great one. Um, what other descriptions do you want on our bo booths on the fill-out form? Let me go. Let me bring up the fill-out form because I know exactly where Karen is. And oh, let me bring up the other tab because I think I'm there. Here we go. So for people who oh, wrong thing, I'm on my site. <laughs> Join us. So I'll run through what I what would be useful on this. So please, if if you haven't seen this video, I think Sean really hit the nail on the head for a test that everybody should do before becoming an audiobook narrator. Even if you've been a narrator for years, what's really great about this is the next time somebody contacts you and asks about being a narrator, Sean's response about what to do, I think, is the best one I've ever heard. So aside from name and email address. I'm asking people to abide by the policies on the on the production page. You can take a look what's there. Um, yes or no here is fine. I just need to know whether you're 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 a union member. And 
this is going to be extended to actually not only cover SAG-AFTRA, but also British equity, because I'm now getting a few people who are British equity, and, and I just need to be able to track that information. Uh, and are you a World Voices organization member? Just interesting, just stuff for me to know, because there are different ways to potentially handle payment. Um, I haven't had to do anything through a paymaster yet because of the way the payments are organized, but I, I would just like to know up front so I can help get those things done. Link to demos is self-explanatory. Downloadable sample in wave or flag format, 30 seconds of room tone and 30 seconds of speech. I'm not looking for something mastered here. I'm just looking for a file where I can hear what the air inside your booth sounds like when you're not in it. Just 30 seconds of room tone, not you tone, and then 30 seconds of you talking. If you can't think of anything, just read the first book that's in front of you or just recite the intro to Gilligan's Island, anything. I just want to hear how you sound in your room and how your room sounds by itself because I'm trying to get a sense of the, of the space on its own, how much mastering, how much post-production work you have to do to go from raw audio to finished work. Your website, self-explanatory, other social media links you're using, could be anything from Pinterest to Facebook to, to LinkedIn, whatever you're using. Uh, information about your studio, do you have a studio? If not, where will you be? And when I say describe, I've had people say, we converted a closet and, and it's lined with Oralex, or um, I talked to Dan Leonard and we have, we have studio suit hung around, or I've got a whisper room in the basement, whatever it is. Any information you can give me to, so that I know what it is I'm listening to here. Am I listening to your bedroom closet? Because if I'm hearing something that might be a pipe in the wall, I can let you know. Um, you know, if I can hear it, if I can turn it up and hear something in the background, if I know I'm listening to a closet versus a purpose-built booth, I can give you some helpful feedback on something that might actually improve your sound. Um, and of course, asking about what microphone interface you're using and what DAW you're using are really just more for me to have, again, a better sense of what I'm listening to up top. It's not about being snobbish. Believe me, I can recommend for you a $150 mic and a $100 interface that will work just fine. You know, So I'm not going to be a microphone snob or an interface snob about this and why I want to know what DAW is. Again, I want to know who I can connect you with. If you're a person who uses Reaper or Twisted Wave, you're probably not going to want me to connect you with somebody to work on things who mostly works in Pro Tools. They're not going to be as helpful to you. So it's about me being able to be more helpful to you. And yeah, I want to know if you're doing punch and roll for the same reason. I want to be able to connect you with the right people. Um, and the same thing, what's going on here is I'm asking all those questions. Will you be doing your own quality control? Will you be sending it out? And will you be doing your own cover art? Will you be doing your own mastering? And like I said, it's about 40% of the people who are doing some of their own. And of that 40%, I would say almost half of them occasionally send out work anyway. Because when things get really busy, you'd rather keep doing your own Matt, you'd rather you'd rather be narrating another book instead of mastering. So I've had people who, during the time when they're working on books for us, start working with an external engineer on some projects. And same thing with cover art. Will you be outsourcing your cover art? Will you be doing it yourself? And it's, again, just a link to see previous work if you're doing it yourself or to who you're working with. And, you know, if you've always wanted to do Little Women, this is where I want to know about it. Uh, and then you'll need to click the I'm not a robot in order to get it to submit. So hopefully, hopefully that answered that question. And it looks like we are at the end of the hour and a half of time that this was scheduled for. I hope I've answered everyone's questions. Uh, there is one thing that I'd love to leave you with here at the end. And uh, it's a link that is in the showcase. I'm bringing it up here. You're the first people to hear about this. I haven't really pushed this anywhere else yet. Uh, you'll see a link called Contest on the Listen to a Book page. 
And what we're doing is we're, in order to inspire more narrators to consider working on a public domain audiobook, we're doing a project where we're going to have a contest and essentially everyone's a winner because regardless of whether or not you win one of the three prizes, um, you will wind up with an audiobook that will, you know, will be paying you royalties year after year, year after year. Um, and so what we're asking for is a public domain audiobook of at least six hours in length. Uh, aside from that, things are pretty wide open. And I'll scroll down the page so I can pull the information up in front of you. Um, the, the final projects need to be submitted by midnight Eastern time, February 29th. And the judging will be done in three rounds. The first round will be about technical quality. Beyond hitting the specs, it's about consistency and clarity from file to file. The top 50% of entries will go on to round two. And in round two, this is sort of a more of a social media assessment. Uh, people will be looking at the saleability of what it is you've put together. Uh, people will be judging the audiobooks based upon their retail samples, their cover art, and their sales copy. Uh, we will be encouraging people to come to the website and vote for which ones they'd be most likely to buy. And we will combine that score with, uh, with scores from judges. And we're in talks with, with uh, established industry professionals to pull, pull together a group of judges. And we'll combine those two scores to find the top 10 entries there, which will then go on to round three. In round three, the judges will go through those top 10 books and everybody will put them in their preferred order, one to 10. And the top three scoring entries will win a cash prize in addition to having their audiobooks published. And that cash prize will be $500 for the first prize and two $250 runners up. Um, so the steps part of this contest are here on the page. If you go to listen to a book slash contest, you can learn more about it there. You're the first people to, to have this information now. I'll be pushing out this information over social media in the next few days. Um, and it's, it's a relatively straightforward process. And we're doing it, like I said, to try to get more people to explore some of these classic titles and to get more of them out there in front of more people and more listeners. And I want to thank you all for your time. And thank you, Tiffany, for, uh, for your vote of confidence. Thank you so much. Um, here we go. Oh, would the info regarding length of hours on the book be listed on Gutenberg, or is there a formula? That's a great question, Karen. Um, there are a couple of different ways of computing um, the audiobook length. Actually, the calculators I tend to use happen to be at the Edge Studio website. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head what the number of words per finished hour that tends to be the case. Different. Some people narrate slightly quicker or slightly slower, so it's really more rule of thumb. Uh, what I'll try to do, Karen, after this is I will see if I can find a link to that calculator. If you go to edgestudio.com, you'll find the calculator there, and I think the audiobook calculator is, uh, you know, the, the job length calculator is there and available for people who even aren't students of Edge to use. I think they've made that public. Um, and if not, I promise I will post somewhere soon the answer to how you generate that length of hours. Of course, one thing you could do is if the book has been recorded before, like let's say the last time it was recorded was in the early 2000s or late 90s, you can look to see what a previous version of that audiobook is um, and, and use that as a guideline. Um, and Okay, so Karen says she was able to find it on the Edge site. Do we need the number of words, though? No, you don't need the number of words. Um, basically, I'm, if something comes in slightly under six hours, it's fine. Um, I'm using six hours because I'm trying to get people to choose some pieces of length. Um, we get a lot of shorter titles that people tend to do. So some of the longer classics um, are, 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 aren't done nearly as often. 
And so six hour, a six hour audiobook isn't too much of, uh, of, of an investment, but I feel like there are things that have been four hours and less that we've gotten a lot more. And, and um, David, quite wonderfully, thank you, David, puts up the answer for us. Uh, it's 9,300 words per, per hour per ACX. So yeah, if you copy and paste the text of the book into Word or something else that'll give you the total word count, you can divide that by 9,300 words and then you'll be in the ballpark. And yeah, if you narrate a little bit faster or slower, you'll be a little bit off of that, but I'm not using the six hours as a hard and fast rule. And just moving through these to see if there are any other questions. I think we're there. And yes, Lori, what you have there on the bottom is what I was remembering, but I just remembered there was something more specific. I was about to say that it's about 10,000 words an hour, but yeah, and I wanted to thank thank the person who went to the edge site and actually found that 9,300. I find that I'm actually a little bit a little bit more than a 9,300 personally, but um, yeah, 10,000 is what was popping to mind for me as well. So I can stay on if anyone has any more questions, um, but we were, I, I think that may be it. So thank you for for coming and thank you for all of your questions. And I hope you found this helpful and um, I will be posting the link to this on YouTube and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.